right. All right. Thank Thanks, you. bro. I'll see you in a minute. See you in a minute. If we get out of control, we'll send somebody up to grab you, okay? So a quick plug for the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. This is such a great class, and I recommend you keep taking it. I teach BM 170, which just ended. You guys have probably seen me leaving as you come in every day. But I had a speaker today, Amy Reese Anderson, phenomenal entrepreneur who sold her business for $377 million, small chunk of change. As she was giving her presentation today, she said, you need to connect with as many people as possible. You need to learn from those who have done it. The Entrepreneur Lecture Series gives that to you. Please keep taking this class. If you're serious about being an entrepreneur, and I assume you are, keep taking this class. It's so easy. And it's the same book every time. You just come and listen, and you're learning from people who have done it. Strongly advise it. Okay? Oh, and by the way, as long as I'm plugging that class, I'm going to plug mine. Take BM 170, the most real class ever taught at BYU. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. See, students of mine. And a minute ago, I had a student here from two years ago that came back today. Um, okay, so BM 170. I think I'll be teaching it in the fall. We'll see. Um, why are you guys taking this class? Oh, cute. Yeah, well, I don't give points, so that's not going to work, but thank you. Yes? Yes? Trying to learn from those who've done it. Okay, you got an A. You listen. You want to be entrepreneurs? Who wants to be an entrepreneur? Okay. Perhaps more interestingly, who does not want to be an entrepreneur? Come on, be brave. Bravery is important. You right there at the top of the aisle. If you don't want to be an entrepreneur, why are you taking this class? Um, I was interested in a different perspective. I, I don't want to be it, but I'd like to learn from people who have done it. So. What about entrepreneurism interests you? Uh, I do like some aspect of the risk. Not quite going all into it, though. You like the risk. How interesting. OK. How many of you like risk? Yeah, that's usually the opposite. Most people, I had an MBA student last fall, uh, not that fall, the one before that, and I was at their golf tournament, and he came up to me, and he, it was the beginning of, it was the MBA launch, and he said, Brother Church, I really want to be an entrepreneur, but I'm so afraid I'm going to fail. I'm <laughs> like, Jared, no worries, mate. Positively, you're going to fail. In fact, if you take my class and you fail, I will give you an A. Because that's what we as entrepreneurs do, is fail. So that's a very interesting perspective. Most people don't want to be entrepreneurs because they're afraid to fail. So interesting. Why else? Why, do you, why are you taking this class if you don't want to be an entrepreneur? Yes, ma'am. I can't even see that far. Do you know how old I am? I can hear you. My hearing isn't gone yet, but I have no idea who's back there. Okay, so you're taking it again. Did we, did we convert you? You're going to be an entrepreneur? Okay, okay. You're back for more. Okay, it's really interesting. So, curiosity, when you grow up, what do you want to do? Fireman exempt, astronaut exempt, what are you going to do? Princess. Princess. <laughs> okay, that was a quality answer. Come on, give it up. I have two princesses I can totally relate. I can also sing all the Disney songs for you, but I won't. What are you going to do? Human resources. Okay, I'll bet she starts her own business, but we're not supposed to bet. So, okay, those of you who want to be an entrepreneur, why? Amy asked this the last hour. It's a super interesting question. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Please. Okay, entrepreneurs are extroverts. They talk. 
Okay, there's a lot going, you know, that you're, you're very involved. So entrepreneurs, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Yes? Okay, instead of just having a part of a project. Love it. Yes, sir. You want to set your own schedule. Okay, that 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. schedule. You want to set that. <laughs> I, I totally get it. Yes, sir. You get to see direct results from your decisions. That is very true. Good answer. Thanks. Yes, sir. I see a hand. I assume it's a human back there. Yes. Cool, I like it. Yes, sir. Have charge over your own success. Take charge over your own success. Have charge, yes. Yes? It offers um, freedom and a lot of creativity. Freedom and creativity. That freedom <laughs> can be arguable at times, OK? Seriously. There was a hand over here. No? Chickened out? OK, sir. If you didn't hear that, you're going to work a ton. It's going to be hard. But the potential to get a greater return for the amount of time and work you put in makes it worth it. That's why. That's a really good answer. And he said to make money. Too often, I don't get people being honest. And most entrepreneurs want to make money. OK, I start my class every day with a quote on the screen. And this is it. Take a moment and digest that. That quote right there suggests you have two choices in life. You guys are so funny. There's like two people per seat on the back three rows, and there's nobody on the front row. And openings right here. I'm so scary. <laughs> there are two choices in life. What are they? Work for yourself or work for somebody. Build your dreams or build somebody else's. OK? So I want you to think about that as I speak with you today, as I share some insights about being an entrepreneur, because this is so real. You will go down one of two roads. You are either going to start your own business and work for yourself, or you're going to go to work for somebody, OK? Traits of an entrepreneur, just throw them out. Passion, hardworking, extrovert, thank you. Cheater, you're in my class. Visionary, saver, resilient. I thought you said Brazilian. Could be resilient, OK? You could be Brazilian, too. Nothing wrong with that, OK? What else? See, the hearing is going now. Yes? Risk taker. OK, are you guys willing to take risks? It's a little scary. OK, risk takers, what else? Strategic. OK, here's my list. Outgoing, confident, passionate, observant, visionary, determined, good listeners. That's an interesting one that I added a few years ago comes from Nail It Then Scale It. You guys are reading. Entrepreneurs need to be good listeners, OK? They're frugal. They're savers. We had a cheater back there that yelled that one out. I love it. High risk tolerance. Fearless, not afraid to fail. They question conventional wisdom. Entrepreneurs revisit the rules. All right, so you all are excited and want to be entrepreneurs. Let me just crash that super exciting thought that you have. Because 90% of startups fail. How's fear factor working for you right now? 90% of startups fail. Why? Why do so many startups fail? Because of the very traits that make up an entrepreneur. You see, you come up with an idea. Throw an idea at me. What? Toilet bowl light. OK, you come up with this. That's a bad idea, because that one was so good. But let's pretend it was bad, OK? 
you come up with an idea for a toilet bowl light and you are so passionate about having a light on your toilet bowl and you have a vision for how you're going to turn that toilet bowl light into ten million dollars wow you must be dumb okay and you are determined to make that succeed because you're an entrepreneur and entrepreneurs are determined I heard somebody who's one of the first words that was yelled out the first traits these are why entrepreneurs fail because you have an idea for a toilet bowl light and the last thing somebody wants to do is touch a urine covered toilet bowl light and so it's never gonna sell but you were so determined and passionate about that idea about that vision you had you ran forward anyway you produced product you went out and tried to sell it and what did you find and nobody was interested in buying it that's why startups fail and so the book that you're reading is the second Bible <laughs> If you will live by what that book is teaching you, nail it, then scale it, they're reading nail it, then scale it. Nail it, then scale it is such a brilliant business, a strategy for starting for startups. So for me, I have sold a number of companies. And I never had nail it, then scale it. A few years ago when they asked me to teach, I chose nail it, then scale it for my textbook because what they gave me was a bunch of case studies. And when they handed that to me in mid-August, and I was supposed to start teaching the first week of September, I looked at it and I said, there's no way. This isn't entrepreneurism. And I reverted to nail it, then scale it, and that's been my textbook. And I'm here to tell you, if you will follow that process of validation I'll talk a little bit about today, that's the difference. That will take 90% failure and turn it into 90% success rate if you will honestly follow that process. My process was at bats. I figured if I started enough businesses, I would eventually crack one over the fence. I did, but with my seven successes, my seven uh, liquidation events, I've had, gosh, I don't know, honey, how many? 70 failures? A lot. Failure does not freak me out. It cost me a lot of money, but it doesn't freak me out, okay? Because those that I cracked over the fence were really fun. All right, so we've got to be really careful about these traits. Being a good listener, you guys are disciples of nail it, then scale it. I abbreviate it, N-I-S-I. -S -I. And so you know the importance of being a good listener. We have, to be so, we have to be careful to not be so passionate about our product that we won't listen. We can't be selling we have to be listening and as you do so the people that you're talking to they will improve your product you will pivot and change your product for the better because your prospective customer they'll tell you what they want in the product and they'll make it better okay how many of you are savers raise your hand that's a pretty good number how many of you are spenders Spenders, come on, this is confession time. I'm your priest, let's get it out. All right, those hands didn't go very high in the sky. You must have heard, my reputation must precede me because I rip on spenders, okay? Those who save, have. Those who have, get. What I'm talking about is savers. Savers, you have much greater odds of going really far in life and being very successful. That success I'm talking about in terms, measuring in terms of wealth, okay? If we have time today, what time do we end? Uh, 4.20. 4.20. If we have time today, I'm going to give you a very quick lesson on how to create wealth. If you were thinking of dozing off and taking a nap, I strongly suggest you stay awake for that five minute segment that if I have time, I will share with you, okay? on creating wealth. It'll be a quick session, a quick version of it. Um, if you don't save, you're getting the immediate gratification right now. You're spending your money, you're getting your reward now. Those who save are blessed. Here's an example. I was sitting at Thanksgiving dinner in the 90s. I know, you guys can't even relate. 
But I was sitting at a Thanksgiving dinner in the late 90s, and my brother-in-law was here, and his sister sitting right there. I happened to marry her. And he's dumber than a sack of rocks. He's a really nice guy. But he is sitting there, and he's telling us about all this money he's making. And he's selling this bottle of weight loss pills called Metabolife. And I am sitting there absorbing these stories. And I'm like, what? He's talking about this little cart in the mall, smaller than that piano, that's generating $150 plus thousand dollars. I'm like, what? And I listen, and I listen, and I listen. And on Monday morning, when my business opened, I grabbed one of my employees, Taylor, and I said, Taylor, I want you to take this book. It's called The Mall Directory of America. And I said, I want you to call every mall in the country. It's about 3,000, 3,500 then. When they pick up the phone, I want you to ask them, do you have a Metabolife cart in your mall? If they say yes, say thank you, goodbye. If they say no, I want you to have them fax you a con fax machines, put a piece of paper in, just come out the other end. We thought it was magic. You wouldn't understand. We had fax machines. I said, I want you to have them fax you a copy of a contract right now, secure the location in the mall immediately. I don't remember how long it took, probably a couple of weeks, we secured 17 carts. Those carts produced millions of dollars over the next few years. A few years into that project, Metabolife Corporate came to us and said, we've decided to go to retail, Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, all the mass retail stores. And so your business is going to dwindle up. We will buy you out. I said, where do I sign? Because we'd had a great run, but now there was Metabo Burn and Metabo Light and Metabo everything. These guys were being sold on street corners. It was craziness. And so I said, gladly. But a whole bunch of people got together, formed a class action lawsuit and sued them. They got zero. For the next three years, I got a wonderful monthly check. On a declining business, that was a wonderful proposition. The point that I make with my story is not, look how cool I am. The dumbest of people could have succeeded in that business. My point was, I had savings. I saw an opportunity at Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's on Thursday. On Monday morning, I capitalized on that opportunity. And 12 months later, we had millions of dollars to show for it. Simplest, easiest printing of money I've ever, been, I've ever experienced. It was brain dead. But it was the savings that made it possible. OK? I can go on and on about savings, and I will. I'll come back. But that's a big one. Being observant. This is a real tough one for your generation. Any of you guys have one of these? No? Lucky you. You guys are cursed. You're cursed in two ways. One, you're cursed with video games. Two, you're cursed with this. Because everywhere you go, this is what you're doing. You're constantly looking at your phone. You're constantly checking Facebook, whatever those others are called. I know President Trump tweets. Sorry, I used that word in here. Not tweet, Trump. <laughs> but you see, to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be observant. Because we're looking for something. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. We are looking for pains. Every day, we're looking for a pain. Because if we can solve that pain and monetize it, we're going to make money. We're going to make bank. But you see, if I'm doing this all day and all night, I'm not doing this. And unless an idea is going to pop up on my screen while I'm looking down, it's going to make it much more difficult for me to identify a pain. So being observant is critical. And you guys are at a disadvantage because of that crutch that you have. Okay. High risk tolerance, fearless, not afraid to fail. Who's afraid? It's cool. I'm afraid. I went to Africa a couple years ago, and my daughter is with us today. She uh, jumped off a gorge, jumped off a bungee thing on a gorge, and free fell for 175 feet before it caught and then continued to swing down. I bought a ticket also. 
but I let my wife use my ticket. <clears throat> there was no way I was jumping off that thing. <laughs> to be an entrepreneur, you do have to have some guts, okay? But I loved what Amy said last hour. Amy said, you know what? Just take the leap. Imagine where you want to be. If there were no fear, if fear were not a factor, what would you do? She challenged everybody last hour to ask that question. If fear weren't a factor, what would your goals be? Those should be your goals. You shouldn't change because of fear. You have to be brave, but there are so many of us to walk you down that road. There are so many of us who have done it. And we sit here at BYU as mentors, free of charge to you, to consult with you and help you make your businesses succeed. You go upstairs to 470 to the Rollins Center, they'll set you up with a mentor, we'll walk you down that path. I spend as much time as I possibly can mentoring. You don't need to be afraid because it's like life. You don't, you're not born one day and need to be married the next or dying, right? Well, you can, never mind. Um, it's steps. Life goes along in steps and we work our way through these different milestones. I will help you start your business in the same manner. It's one milestone, then it's the next, then the next. And as we go down that road, taking it one small step at a time, Starting a business is no big deal. Your fear is of failing. What does NISI teach you? What? Thank you. NISI teaches us to fail fast and fail cheap. It doesn't teach us to borrow 50 Gs from our mother-in-law who mortgaged her house to give you that 50 Gs. You thought she was difficult before. And it doesn't spend, say spend the next two to four years of your life trying to make this dog hunt that doesn't have a prayer. It says fail fast and fail cheap. My definition of fail fast, fail cheap, six weeks, no more than 500 bucks. That's scary? I know you're poor, but 500 bucks you can recover from. Okay? And really, 500 bucks is an extreme case. It doesn't take 500. Okay, so don't be afraid to fail. Let us walk you down that road and help you to succeed, okay? That's my job. I'm, I'm unemployed, I, that's what I do, I help you. So this is a super interesting article, you can read the whole thing, I'll just paraphrase it for you quickly. This was in the Dallas Morning News and it was written by a guy who was previously an admissions counselor at Princeton University. And he said it's so interesting. He's now removed and writes this article. And his message is this. All of these Ivy League kids, you guys are getting remarkably close to an Ivy League school. So don't think, oh, they're dumb. Okay? But he says, look, all of these Ivy League kids, there's one problem with them. They have all been walked with mom and dad, protected, shielded, Guaranteed success in life. When Johnny wasn't doing well in math, what did he have? The best tutor. When Susie was going to take piano, that wasn't sexist like, you know, math and, and piano. It just happened to come out that way. Susie want, or Joey wanted to take piano. They had the best instructor. Same went for violin. Same went for equestrian. Same went for sword fighting. Whatever those folks do to get into those schools. My point is this. They were walked down a road that had bumpers on both sides, shielding them from risk their entire lives. And so you know what? Entrepreneurism is not their game. Because they've never, ever been exposed to risk. Super interesting article. Read it if you'd like. Okay, so a big question that I get from you guys, where do ideas come from? I need you to be observant, okay? We are looking for a pain. So Matt Alexander, one of my favorite people in the world, student a few years ago, Matt was looking for a pain, okay? And 
Matt was home. He was, it was nighttime. He wakes up in the middle of the night. We're going back to the toilet bowl. You ready for this? This is the positive version of the toilet bowl. Walks in the bathroom at night, flips on the light, gets stung, and says, ah, oh, such a pain. He thinks, wait a minute. I'm looking for a pain. How could I monetize that? Stupid idea, right? So Matt puts together this light. He goes to the store and he buys a string of lights. And he puts it together and he fashions it to go inside the toilet bowl. And then he buys a motion detector and he connects that to it. And so on the front of the bowl is a motion detector that turns on an LED light on the inside. So when you walk in your bathroom, bing, your toilet bowl lights up with a really nice soft light in the middle of the night. No eye shock. Stupid idea, right? First we built a website. We tested it. We validated it. It validated. People said, yeah, I'd buy that. In fact, I'd buy three. Well, that's like three times validation. <laughs> that's better than validation. His product validated. It validated really well. You guys know what validation is, right? We're reading NISI. So he didn't meet the 50% rule. He met the 80, 90% rule. Thumbs up, okay? So Matt keeps going forward and um, he puts it on Kickstarter. I can't remember. $140,000 in like seven days. Pretty good validation, okay? Pre-orders, people are sending you their money and they're gonna get a toilet bowl light four to six months from now, maybe. Okay, pretty good validation. So they come, and Matt's got a website. Every time his container arrived, it was pre-sold. He had so many orders waiting, every time a container arrived from China, they were gone. So Matt then got onto Amazon and got into HSN or Bed, uh, then Bed Bath Beyond. Now he's in Walmart, Target, every mass retailer. And in November of last year, he sold his business for a number that I've already said. But that's not my business, so I'm going to leave it alone. Stupid toilet bowl light. <laughs> but you see, he was solving a pain. Amy shared with us last hour, and it's so true. We don't have to revolutionize. We don't have to invent something new. Okay? We can take, simply take an existing idea and do it better. So many people become multi-gazillionaires taking existing ideas and doing it better than that which exists or starting a company that provides a service but they do it better than the current providers. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, is this a monetizable pain? When we talk about a monetizable pain, we're not talking about a mosquito bite. We're looking more for a shark bite, okay? We typically don't go to the hospital when we get a mosquito bite. We have a scratch for a couple days and it's gone. But most people that get a shark bite go to the hospital, okay? That's our spectrum. Mosquito bite, shark bite. Vitamins, Oxycontin. Sorry, I know it's a bad word today, but okay? We're looking for things that tend to be more on this end, but don't think that's the only way to go. I had a gentleman speak in my class two or three weeks ago, and he started Dazzy. You guys wear Dazzy, Dazzy ties? Okay. He did $1.5 million last year in tie sales. He does it out of his home. You know what his overhead is? Zero. He and his wife are partners. They represent the two employees of the company. Skinny ties with floral designs. Okay? What an amazing success. Go buy a Dazzy tie, will you? Help your fellow BYU student. <laughs> well, he's a grad now. He graduated last year. Would you call that a mosquito bite or a shark bite? Yeah! Not even West Nile mosquito. Just a mosquito. He did 1.5 and he expects to do 3 this year. Go Dazzy. Okay. My buddy calls me in 2007 and he says, hey Corbin, I've got a product I want to show you. I'm like, okay, what is it, Chris? And he says, it's a handbag. I said, okay, 
well, don't you think that's a really dumb idea? And he says, no, no. I said, come on, Chris. There are so many handbags out there. I mean, you've got bags at Walmart for 20 bucks. And then you could go to coach at 400 to two grand. You could go to Gucci. We were in, uh, where were we? I forget. Hong Kong. And we were walking along the streets a couple weeks ago. And we walked past the Gucci store and I said, let's play a game. How much do you think that bag is? And what did you say? No, you're cheating. She didn't say that much. Okay, she said 6,500. What did I say? Really? You're reversing the numbers. Okay, she says 2,400. So we go in, we go around the windows, and we go to go in the store. We have to wait in line to enter the store. You've got to be kidding me. We get in the store, and I'm like, how much is that bag? How much do you think that silly bag was? Smaller than that. Wrong. How much was it? Like 12 grand for a bag. Okay, so the spectrum's covered, right? 20 bucks, 12 grand. There's probably some more. But my point is, how are you going to squeeze into that crowded space, Chris? That's got to be the dumbest idea I've ever heard. He says, just, just let's have lunch. Let's talk about it. All right, come on down. Let's have lunch. So Chris comes in and he says, look, women, they like their bag to match their outfit. I did pretty good today. Women, they like their bag to match their outfit. And as such, they're constantly changing their bag. So they're dumping their contents out, they scoop them up, they put them in another bag, and off they go to the 4th of July parade, and their bag matches the holiday, okay? So guys, you wouldn't understand this, we don't do that. We don't care what we look like. But women do. And he says, so Corbin, what if, instead of dumping all your stuff out, scooping it up and putting it in another product. What would that be? A pain. A definite pain. Because if I left my key to my apartment in here, or my ATM card, I got a serious problem on my hand, my subway card. But what if I could simply take one exterior off, put another exterior on in three seconds, in my closet, I have 25 of them. Some people had 1,000. More the merrier. Look at that. Now, ladies, you're not my demographic. Interesting, right? But do you like to change your bag and have your bag match your outfit? Does your mom? Your mom does, yeah. You guys don't carry handbags. So I'm not going to validate with you. That business sold for a lot of money. We won't get into those details. A lot. In three years, during the downturn of the economy, remember we started that business in 2007. We sold it in 2010 for nine figures. Okay? In a super crowded, super noisy industry. Get it? There are ideas all around us. So many youth come to me, young people, whatever you are, I wish I were you. They come and they say, there's just no ideas left. Because they come up with an idea and they go to USPTO.gov and they look for the patent and it's taken. That's just not necessary. It's great if you can find something patentable. It's easier for me to help you raise money. But it's not essential. Okay, here's another way to come up with ideas. I require my class to do this as an assignment. And this is to keep a journal. You want to be an entrepreneur? You want to come up with an idea? You want some, something that's novel, maybe revolutionary? Here's your assignment. I want you to keep a journal. Every single day, this could be a small notebook, you'll probably keep it on your phones. It'll make me mad, but keep it on your phones. Have a little notebook, and every day, just write a couple of lines in that book that are entrepreneurial. What I'm trying to do with this exercise with my class is to get them to think entrepreneurially every single day. If you will treat yourself to think, train yourself to think entrepreneurially, you will come up with ideas. You'll always be looking for something. You don't go to bed until you've written two things in that book. Get your wife on board. At the beginning of the semester, a husband and wife came in and sat down with me. And they opened their book. They'd been working on it together. He's in my class, she's not. 
They'd been working on their ideas together and they presented them to me together and we went through them. Do it together. If you're single, it's a little more difficult to do it together. Come up with these ideas. So many hundreds of times. Those ideas have produced companies that I have mentored that are producing money for people. I wouldn't tell you to do this if it weren't very real, okay? How are we doing on time, Janet? Okay, validation. I'm not gonna go through validation because validation you know, okay? Validation is what NISI teaches you, and so I'm not gonna go through that except to say this right here will take that 90% failure rate and turn it into a 90% success rate. Not if it's a failure. Fail fast, fail cheap. Those failures are great. I learned quickly that that dog wasn't gonna hunt and I dispatched it and moved on to my next project. But when you move on to something that validated, chances of its, fail uh, chances of its failure are very, very small. Okay, that's all I have to say there. All right, wrapping up. I'll get to creating wealth if I can. Lessons for along the journey. As entrepreneurs, we tend to lose focus. The last two homes that I bought were really big homes. And I, I'm not bragging, I buy them as investments. I bought two really big homes and I bought them at, let's say a third the price that it cost me. Massive upside for me. Both circumstances were a couple in distress because of divorce. Big home, connotes what? Success, probably. Right? Pretty obvious where I'm headed, right? Somebody took their eye off the ball. As entrepreneurs, we have to be so careful. Everybody does. But especially us as entrepreneurs, we can be, we get to set our own schedule, right? Yeah, you wanna see some entrepreneur schedules? They start at about 6 a.m., they go till about midnight. Quick break for dinner, check in with the fam, right back into the office. Okay, you might have a successful business with that schedule. But why are you starting a business? To be rich? to be creative, to all these things, but why, why do you want all those things? Why ultimately are you doing it? For your family, why do you want your, why, why are you doing it for your family? Okay, I'm being difficult. I'm, time, okay, but you want time for something else. I can boil every one of your answers down to one thing. Everything we do, we do to be happy. Everything we do, we do to be happy. If we started a business to get money so that we could be happy, because that's what a lot of people believe but you toasted your family in the process. You failed. That's the failure you should be worried about. Not the failure. Lessons along the journey. Okay? So, lessons along the journey. You gotta have balance, okay? These are the five areas. I've adapted it for students, okay? Because this is more your lives. You need to work, pay for school, some of you have family, some of you need to check in on home because this is where the check comes from. You gotta keep your health in balance. We gotta take care of our homework and our school and our spirituality. Pretty rough your lives right now, right? I meet with a lot of students, I know how busy you are. It's tough to do all these things. So if one of these is gonna be let go, which one would it be? I want you to pick one. Which one? Plaid shirt, yeah, you're busted. Which one are you gonna let go? We are gonna mock you when you answer it. Come on, pick one. There's not enough hours in the day and not enough days in the week. What? Work. You're, how are you gonna pay for your schooling, dude? What did you say? Help, excellent choice. Let's get fat, let's deteriorate, let's get atrophy. Let's just wither away. I can mock you no matter what you say. But here's what a lot of people do. I see a lot of entrepreneurs leave the church, lose their faith, okay? We've got to keep our lives in balance. Newton's cradle, you know what that is? 
you know those little five balls that hang and you pull one up and it hits and the other one goes that sits on my desk and that's a reminder to me of these five areas of life that need to be kept in balance none of those can be out of balance I hope you wrote those down because you got to do something every day make it your screensaver put it on the front of your notebook whatever you got to keep these things in balance guys okay number two integrity Clayton Christensen wrote, How Will You Measure Your Life? I don't have time to tell you, a really cool book boils down to this. Clayton graduated with a master's degree from Harvard. He now teaches there at LDS. But he said, look, at my five-year reunion, here were all these people who were so successful. They graduated with MBAs from Harvard. They got the best, most high-paying jobs in the country. Very successful people. At the 10-year reunion, they were married. Things were going. At the 15-year reunion, something started to change. People were divorced. Marriages were in trouble. At the 20-year reunion, parents were estranged from their children. And as the years kept going and the reunions kept coming, now people ended up in jail. One of his partners was Schilling from Enron. You see it all the time. I see people in my businesses trying to cut corners. Why? Well, a lot of times because the competition is. How can I compete if the competition is cutting corners and I can't? I don't know. Figure it out. But don't play that game. Never cross that line. Never go down that road. Okay? The three things that he taught. He told his class these three things every day. Be happy in your career, have a quality family life, and stay out of jail. Every day he ended class with those three things. Okay, and lastly, when you build your businesses, find a way to give back. Okay, first of all, your generation, props to you in this regard, don't love you for your cell phone usage, don't love you for your video game playing, but you guys are very earth-minded, you're very uh, social-minded. And to have a social component to your company is really good. Create some way for your company to give back. You will connect with a lot more people in doing so. Don't do it to build your business. Do it because you're a good person, okay? And lastly, remember your why. Why do you want to do this? Why did you want to become an entrepreneur? I need you. One of your speakers later on in the semester will be Amy. Amy's going to teach you how to do what's that board? What? Goal board, vision board. She's going to teach you that. She's going to pound it into your head. Okay? That's your why. It's why you're doing it. Okay? And I want to share my why with you in conclusion. I told you I'd teach you how to create wealth. I will do that if you have time to come to the Q&A. Come to the Q&A. I promise to teach you how to create wealth. Okay? Because it's one of the best lessons you'll be taught at BYU. I'm not bragging. I'm just teaching you this is how it's done. This is why we do everything. And this right here is the answer to happiness. Don't throw your family away over the success of your business. Don't mess with it. Okay? These are humanitarian trips. I know Machu Picchu is not a humanitarian trip, but you know, after we did our humanitarian work, we went and checked Machu Picchu out. But this is what brought us happiness. And my great friend John Huntsman, who just passed away, said selfless giving unto others represents one's true wealth. Wealth is not massive homes and fast cars. Wealth, as I teach it, is how long can you live on your passive income? How long can you live on what you have? If you leave today and you're crossing the crosswalk, and some kid drives through and runs you over, and you no longer have the ability to work and create an income for yourself. How long can you subsist? The answer to that question is the answer to how wealthy am I? If you can say forever, you're wealthy. If you can say I've got three months savings, enjoy those three months. All right? I'll see you guys in Q&A. Thanks for coming.